So I invite you to take God's Word and turn with me to Mark chapter 1. Today we shall look at verses 16 through 18. Tonight, verses 19 and 20. The title of the message today is, Drop Everything and Follow Him. Mark chapter 1, beginning in verse 16. As he was going along by the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. Going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were also in the boat, mending their nets. Immediately, he called them. And they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired servants and went away to follow him. A recognized authority on etiquette was recently asked, how should one respond properly to an invitation to the White House to dine with the President? The answer was straightforward and clear. A White House invitation is a direct command, drop everything and go immediately. This is precisely the way these fishermen responded to the invitation of Jesus Christ. They considered this invitation to be a direct command and obligatory upon their lives. They dropped everything and immediately followed Christ. And suddenly everything in their lives was downgraded to the level of a secondary level. Their business was now secondary. Their relationships were now secondary. Nothing else was as important as this call. This call was now suddenly elevated to the role in their lives of what is primary and what is preeminent. Nothing else must take precedence over this call. Not career, not family concerns, not other responsibilities, not other duties. This was now job number one. This call was in reality a summons issued with sovereign authority. This call was a divine mandate from the throne above. This call was a divine command necessitating their immediate obedience. It was binding. It was non-negotiable. It was obligatory upon their lives. And this call necessitated that they drop everything and follow Christ. They could not have one foot in the boat and one foot on dry land. This required that they forsake it all for the sake of the call. They must now be willing and ready to go anywhere, do anything with anyone, and pay any price. This was the call to abandon it all in order to reach the world for Christ by becoming fishers of men. This call was uniquely extended to these four fishermen. Simon, Andrew, James, and John. It was a call to leave behind their business, their homes, their family, and travel in close association with Christ for the next three years to be personally taught and trained by the Master Himself in order that they might continue the work which He began in His three-year ministry. I want you to know that as we look at this today, in the broadest sense, in one way or another, this call is extended to every one of us who know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. Christ is calling each one of us here today to leave behind the temporal cares and passing concerns of this world and to follow Him personally 
and to be taught and trained by Him internally and to become fishers of men. This, in reality, is the call of the Great Commission that is extended to every disciple of Jesus Christ. This morning, I want to look at verses 16 through 18 tonight, verses 19 and 20. And this morning, as we look at these first three verses, the outline is very simple. There are three verses, and there are three major headings. In verse 16, I want you to see the individuals He called. And then in the next verse, verse 17, the invitation He issued. And finally, in verse 18, the impact He made. And tonight, we will continue in the next two verses. I want us to look first at verse 16 this morning as we look at God's Word. And I want you to see first the individuals He called. I want you to see that Christ called unto Himself for His use in His service two fishermen named Simon and Andrew. Look at verse 16. As He was going along by the Sea of Galilee, stop right there. As this scene begins, Jesus is one year into His earthly ministry. And He is walking along the shoreline of the Sea of Galilee. Galilee is in northern Palestine where Jesus would spend 90% of His life here upon the earth. And it was the central theater for His public ministry. And the Sea of Galilee within Jerusalem within Galilee was the most prominent place in our Lord's Galilean ministry. It was here that Jesus would perform many of His miracles. It was here that Jesus would issue many of His discourses. And so the Sea of Galilee would be the main theater for His Galilean ministry and it can be argued for the entirety of His earthly ministry. The Sea of Galilee is an inland lake. It's about twelve and a half miles long and seven and a half miles wide. It's not really a sea, it's a lake. It is a warm water lake and it is 680 feet below sea level. It was a place of a thriving fishing industry. And Josephus reports in the first century at this time that there were some 240 fishing boats that frequented these waters on a daily basis. It was a hub of activity and a hub of commerce. And as Jesus was going along by the Sea of Galilee, He saw He saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon. And the reason he saw them is because he was looking for them. And the reason he was looking for them is because he had already chosen them to be his instruments to be used in his gospel ministry. And so Simon and Andrew were two brothers who worked together in this common fishing business. They were partners together in their business enterprise. And this was not the first time that Jesus had met them. Don't get the idea this is the first time they've ever heard His voice or the first time they've ever seen them. And out of the blue, He just says, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. And instantly, without any more information, they just turned around and walked off. These are saved businessmen who have known the Lord Himself for, for a year or slightly more than a year. They were converted to Christ in John chapter 1. And there has been an entire uh, period of time from one Passover to another Passover that has elapsed. And these two saved businessmen, these two converted Fishermen are bringing glory to God as they continue to diligently do their work as fishermen. And Jesus saw them. And Jesus was looking for them because these were two men whom He has chosen to be a part of His ministry team and who will surround Him and flank Him 
and one day he will pass the baton to them to continue the work that he himself has begun upon this earth. And so as he saw them, in verse 16 it says, they were casting a net in the sea. All those whom the Lord calls are actively engaged in serving and working. God calls no spectators. God calls no pacifists. God calls none who are idly sitting and doing nothing. God calls those who are engaged in doing what He has placed before them to do. And so we are not surprised to see that even when the call of God will come upon their lives to leave their nets, to leave this vocation, and to step forward into full-time ministry that they are found busily serving and working. And it says they are casting a net in the sea, for they were fishermen. They were doing what they always did, day in and day out. They were fishermen. And they were casting a net in the sea. They were not using a hook and line as men do today for uh, uh, a form of recreation. Rather, they, these were professional fishermen whose livelihood depended upon their success and they were not catching fish one at a time. That would be a lousy way to make a, a living. Instead, they had a net. It was a large, oval, circular net that had weights on it. And it was about nine feet long. And it would be hurled out into the sea. And then it would find its way of sinking down. And hopefully, they could catch many fish, hopefully even a school of fish, by casting it out into the sea. So they were fishermen by trade. They were hardworking. They were industrious. They were energetic. They were brave and courageous. They were disciplined. They were risk-taking fishermen who knew what it was to leave the safety of the shoreline and to launch out into the deep and out into the night at times, and out even into the storm in order to do their work. And all of these would be necessary attributes that our Lord would need in the kind of men to be put into the ministry. I find it startling and even encouraging that this is where our Lord began calling His ministry team together. Jesus did not begin in the temple in Jerusalem by calling the spiritual elite from the religious establishment of the day. There would be too much that would need to be broken down, stripped down, and removed, if not even saving faith given to them before He could begin to build them up. No, these men were a blank blackboard upon which He could impart His truth and they would be receptive <coughs> to His teaching. Jesus did not begin by calling those who were highly religious and steeped in their tradition, like the Pharisees and the scribes and the lawyers of Israel. And I also find it encouraging, and I say encouraging as I think about my own life, is I came not from a, a long line of preachers and pastors from my own home, just simply from middle-class America, from a hard-working family that God has called me. And also, He did not call them from the palace as they were already, as if they were already kings and princes. He did not call the rich and the famous to come stand with Him. Rather, Jesus called to Himself the salt of the earth, the sweat of the brow kind of people who had calloused hands and sunburned skin and a strong work ethic and who were daring and who were perspiring and who threw themselves into whatever was set before them. He did not call timid little souls who were afraid of launching away from mother's apron. 
He called strong fishermen who had the kind of character qualities that he could fashion and form who would be used to turn the world upside down with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So why did Christ choose them? I've already in part given the answer, but from a divine perspective, why Christ chose these is that from a divine perspective, the greatness of God's grace is seen in His choosing those who seem to be the least likely to be put into His service so that the greatest glory comes to Himself. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 26 makes this abundantly clear. This is God's method. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong. Verse 28, and the base things of the world and the despised God has chosen. Did you hear that? This is whom God has chosen for the most part to work through those who have been passed over by the world so that when God works in and through them, greatest glory will come to Himself. He will not share the spotlight with anyone in His ministry. And at the same time, as I just said, from a human perspective, they possessed many of the character qualities that by nature fishermen possessed that are desirable for the gospel ministry. These fishermen were brave and courageous, self-starting, early, rising, hard-working, risk-taking, disciplined, devout, dedicated to what they did. All admirable qualities for men to be employed in the ministry. Jesus does not need prima donnas serving Him. He does not need pampered egos in His service. But rather men who are known more for their perspiration than for their position and more for their hard work than for their life of ease. J.C. Ryle, the great Englishman of the 19th century, has written at this point, quote, It is clear from these words that the first followers of our Lord were not the great of this world. They were men who had neither riches nor rank nor power. But the kingdom of Christ is not dependent upon such things as these. His cause advances in the world, quote, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord, unquote, Zechariah 4, 6. The church which began with a few fish fishermen and yet spread over half the world must have been founded by God, unquote. The same is true today. God is looking for men and women common men, common women, who have the raw gifts of discipline and devotion and dedication, and it is from these whom God most often calls. One snowy morning at 5 a.m., a missionary candidate rang the bell at a missionary examiner's home. Ushered into the office, he sat three hours past his appointed time waiting for his interview. At 8 a.m., a retired missionary appeared and began his questioning. He said to the missionary candidate, Can you spell? Uh, yes, sir. All right, spell Baker. B-A-K-E-R. Fine. How are you with numbers? Well, uh, pretty good. Then add 2 plus 2. 4. You've passed your missionary exam. I'll tell the board tomorrow. The next day at the board meeting, the examiner reported on the interview. He has all the qualifications for a fine missionary. First, 
I tested him on self-denial, making him arrive at my home at five in the morning. He left a warm bed on a snowy morning without any complaint. Second, I tested him on promptness. He arrived on time. Third, I examined him on patience. I made him wait three hours to see me. Fourth, I tested him on temper. He failed to show any anger or aggravation. Fifth, I tried his humility by asking him questions that an even a seven-year-old child could answer, and he showed no indignation. So you see, I believe the candidate meets the requirements. We have here a fine missionary. Well, there is certainly more involved than merely this. One must be equipped in the Word of God. We understand that. There are many other things necessary, but more than God needs your ability, He needs your availability. And more than your fame, He needs your faith. And more than your scholarship, He needs your relationship with Him. And these things form the very base of the one whom God uses. No matter who you are or where you are, no one is beyond the strong arm of the Lord for God to use you mightily in His kingdom work. Now, second, I want you to note not only the individuals He called, but secondly, the invitation He issued in verse 17. As Jesus approached these two brothers... He saw them hard at work, casting their nets, laboring over, under the hot Judean sun when he called them to himself. So in verse 17, watch this. Jesus said to them. Note who takes the initiative. Jesus called them. They did not volunteer for this. They did not appoint themselves to this. The sentence reads, Jesus said to them, there is this top to bottom flow by sovereign choice and divine initiative. John MacArthur writes, quote, God always chooses His partners. He chose Noah, Abraham, Moses, and David. He chose the prophets. He chose Israel herself to be a, a nation of partners. Jesus told His disciples, you did not choose Me. But I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, unquote. These men whom he calls are sovereignly chosen by God for this task. And all who are saved are not only chosen for salvation, but they are also chosen to serve and they are chosen to serve at the Lord's bidding. So notice what he says. Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. These words, follow me, are the most repeated words of Christ in the New Testament. Let me repeat that again. These words, follow me, are the most repeated words of Christ in the New Testament. Recorded 13 times. Jesus said this more than anything else He ever said. It was the most issued statement from His lips. And this invitation, follow me, was really a command, an imperative command. It was not a uh, an option. It was not a suggestion for them. They were not allowed to weigh in on this and decide whether or not they wanted to do this. This was binding upon their lives. And as Jesus said this to them, by the sovereign authority of the Lord Himself, He issued this imperative Follow me. They now are left in a place of obedience or disobedience. There is no need to pray about this. There is no need to consult others about this. For the Lord has spoken. And only excuse making would prevent them from moving forward in obedience to this call that has come to them. 
This call was for them to lay aside their business concerns and enter full-time into the business of reaching people for His kingdom. It was a call to leave behind their nets, to leave behind their fishing enterprise, to leave behind their family and friends, to go physically with Christ as He moved from place to place to place and to spiritually become more and more like Him. It is a call to learn from Him, to listen to Him, to live like Him, to sit at His feet. It is a call to be trained and to be taught for ministry. And it is ultimately a call to invest one's life into the service of the kingdom of God. J.C. Ryle also writes at this point, the meaning of this expression is clear and unmistakable. The disciples were to become Fishers for souls. They were to labor to draw people out of darkness into light and from the power of Satan to God. They were to strive to bring people into the net of Christ's salvation so that they might be saved and not perish everlastingly. Lest there be any mistake what is going on here. This is a call to lifelong ministry. It is a call to evangelism. It is a call to soul winning. It is a call to global missions. It is a call to outreach to a world that is perishing and desperately in need of being rescued and delivered from their sin. So what is involved in this? Follow me and I will make you fishers of men. I want to give you several marks of what this means to follow me. And as I give you these marks by way of secondary application, they apply to every one of us here today. And even if you remain with your nets or with your day job or with your bank job or as a school teacher, you nevertheless are called to serve and follow Christ right where you are. And these marks will be true for you even if you are to stay right where you are. I have nine of them. That's why the message will finish tonight. But I want to drain this of every drop of meaning and truth. I don't want to gloss over what Jesus most often said. I don't want to snorkel this passage. I want to go down deep into this passage. And I want you to see what it means for Christ to say to you, follow me. All nine of these marks will be true for your life if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. What does it mean to follow Christ? Number one, they must follow Him personally. Personally. Notice He says, follow Me. He does not say, follow institutional religion. He does not say, follow religious activities. He does not even say, follow a group. He does not say follow a cause or follow a creed or follow a code. Jesus says, follow me. And this presupposes a personal saving relationship with Christ. This is in the context of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. No one can follow Christ until you know Christ. Until you know Christ, you are merely following the world. Or you are following religion. Or you are following some form of activity. It is not until you come to know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior can you truly know Christ. I think of Martin Luther, the great reformer, who was an Augustinian monk and a professor of Bible at the University of Wittenberg who taught the Psalms and Romans, even posted his 95 theses on the Wittenberg door. 
in the entirety of that time to that point, he was a follower of the law of Moses. And to that point, he was a follower of the vain traditions of the church. And he was a follower of the Pope and the Cardinals. Until that time in the tower where he had his tower experience, and he came to understand in his heart of hearts that the just shall live by faith. And that it was an alien or foreign righteousness outside of himself that would be given through the gospel of Jesus Christ on into his public ministry, Martin Luther finally realized the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Luther said, the gates of paradise were swung open to me. And he entered in with childlike faith. And he became a follower of Jesus Christ. This is what it means to be a follower of Christ. That you're not a follower of a church. You're not a follower of a denomination. You're not a follower of other people who are following Christ. You're not a follower of of other men. You are personally a follower of Jesus Christ in your heart of hearts. And one year before, these fishermen had crossed the line and come through the narrow gate and were followers of Jesus Christ. Now listen to this. And for the rest of their lives, whatever they did, wherever they went, they followed Jesus. Christ. That's what it is for you to be a follower of Christ. You follow Him. Second, they must follow Him closely. As Jesus said, follow me, He is inviting them in this setting, in this first century arena to travel with Him, to spend time with Him, to enter into His inner circle and to be in His presence and to know Him more fully and deeply and to learn from Him and to be close to Him, to be taught by Him, to absorb His words, to sit at His feet, to spend time with Him and to be in closest fellowship with Him. You understand when He said, follow me, He is saying, I want you with me at my side. The same is true for us today, 2,000 years later. As we are followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, that means we spend much time with Him, does it not? We spend time sitting at His feet in His Word, and we spend time before Him in prayer And we spend time talking to Him and hearing Him talk to us through the written pages of Scripture. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. It means to follow Him personally and to follow Him closely. Third, they must follow Him unconditionally. Would you look at this again? Jesus said, follow me. He does not tell them where they're going. He does not give them a five-year plan. He does not give them a six-month calendar. He does not answer all the questions for their family. He simply says, follow me. He does not tell them how they will get there. He does not tell them what the future holds. In fact, as Martin Luther said, if I knew what all the ministry held for me, I would have never come in the first place. It was the mercy and grace of God that I didn't even fully know all that I was getting into. There is a wonderful grace of God simply to say, follow me. That's what it is for us to follow Christ. We don't follow Him on our terms. We don't follow Him depending upon how we want to do this. We follow Him blindly. We follow Him unconditionally. We follow Him no matter what the future 
may hold. Fourth, they must follow him humbly. Please note the, uh, the, the order of this. Jesus said, follow me. He didn't say, I'll come join up with your life and I'll now be a partner with you in your life. I'll be your co-pilot. Jesus did not say, where do you want to go and I'll help you get there. Jesus, by this, is saying it's over for you. Calling the shots in your life. You will follow me wherever I take you. We'll not be working off your agenda anymore. We will be working off my agenda. To follow Christ means that you no longer do your own thing. It means you no longer go your own way. It means you no longer call your own shots. You cannot follow Christ and live for yourself. Call to follow Christ demands self-denial. It demands death to self. It demands an unreserved yielding to Him who calls. Quite frankly, it is a matter of lordship. And it requires their submission and their obedience to step out and follow. Number five, they must follow Him publicly. As Jesus now calls them, From their boats and from their fishing business, there is a sense in which they are lurking in the protection of the shadows somewhat. And now as He calls them, it is a call to advance to the front lines. It is a call to be clearly seen and identified with Him in public. It is now now a call to be publicly identified by the eyes of the Jewish leaders and of the Roman officials, there are no secret service disciples in the army of Christ. Only front-line soldiers. And all this is to say we cannot follow Christ and remain in the shadows of anonymity, hidden from the watching eyes of those around us, When we step out to follow Christ, it is before the world that is so opposed to Him. Number six, and this is so important, they must follow Him constantly. Follow me is in the present tense, which means they were to be continually and constantly following Him. In other words, this is saying, He is saying, follow me always. Follow me from now on. Follow me day in, day out. Follow me morning and evening. Follow me 24-7. Leon Morris writes in his commentary on this passage in Matthew's Gospel, which says, follow me. Matthew uses the present tense, as does Mark. This call clearly points to a lasting association. Jesus is not inviting them to a pleasant stroll along the seashore, but inviting them to discipleship, unquote. In other words, this is not an isolated act. This isn't a weekend conference to get fired up and then go back to reality. This was done, not done once, never to be repeated. This was a lifetime commitment that had no turning back until the final barrier is crossed and the crown is received. That's what it means for you and me to be a follower of Jesus Christ. This isn't a Sunday morning deal. This is a Monday morning deal. This is a Friday night deal. This is what we do every moment of every day. We are following Jesus Christ. Christ. We are not taking our cues from the world. We are not taking our cues from religion. We are following Jesus Christ every moment of every day. Number seven, they must follow Him practically. And by practically, by that it is implied here that as they follow Him they will begin to walk like Him and talk like Him. And they will, 
hear his teaching and then pass on his teaching for one who was a follower in this first century and who is a disciple is one who becomes exactly like his teacher. In fact, Jesus said in Luke 6, verse 40, a disciple is not above his teacher. But everyone, after he has been fully trained, will be like his teacher. He is to follow in imitation. He is to imitate the one he follows. And I want to tell you, we all are imitating others. There are very little original thoughts in this world. We are all parrots repeating what we have heard and seen from others. Far more so than what any of us even realize and how important it is that we be following Jesus Christ and imitating Him. Number eight, they must follow Him purposefully. In other words, this isn't just a hangout time with Jesus. In other words, this isn't just like, isn't this cool to spend time with Jesus? There is a purpose for this. This is simply a means to a greater end. And the greater end is a result of spending this time with Jesus. The higher purpose, the bigger picture, is that Jesus would make them to become fishers of men. Notice he says, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. Jesus is saying, as you follow me, I will train you. I will teach you. This speaks to the sufficiency of the Lord Jesus Christ. It speaks to the sufficiency of the words of Christ. It speaks to the sufficiency of the Spirit of Christ. It speaks to the sufficiency of being in the school of Christ. If you will follow me, no matter what you don't know, no matter what you don't have, no matter how far away you may be from what you need to become, if you will simply follow me, I will take whatever it is you bring to the table and I will make you to become fishers of men. How encouraging this is. That if we will follow Christ daily, constantly, He will make us into what we must become. Mothers, this is what you need. To be the mother you must be. You follow Christ. And He will make you to become a fisher of your son and of your daughter. Fathers, this is what you need. Follow Christ. That's why our men's ministry, we're not giving you techniques on how to whatever. We are pointing you to the Savior. And if you will follow the Savior, He will make you what you must become. It is the sufficiency of His grace in our lives. It is the power of sanctification to take us from where we are and mature us and make us into what we must become. So they must follow Him purposefully. And so we must follow the Lord purposefully. And what is this purpose? What is this purpose? That we would become fishers of men. That we would rescue the perishing and care for the dying, snatch them from pity and sorrow in the grave, to weep over the erring one. God has sent us into the world to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are to be fishers of men. And let me tell you, if you're not fishing, you're not following Follow me and I will make you to become fishers of men. There are people for all of us. 
to be reaching for the Lord Jesus Christ. Spurgeon said, any Christian has a right to disseminate the gospel who has an ability to do so. And more, he not only has the right, but it is his duty to do so. The propagation of the gospel is left not to a few, but to all the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. He goes on to talk about how each man, each woman is called to make fishers, to, 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 to be fishers of men and to capture those who are lost and without Christ. They must follow Him purposefully. And so must you and I. Whatever part of the lake you live in, whatever part of the lake you row in, whatever part of the lake you swim in, there are fish all around you that are lost and in need of salvation. And God has placed you there to reach them for Christ. There's a last word that I want you to see. Not only must they follow Him purposefully, but number nine, they must follow Him daringly. Implied in this metaphor of become fishers of men was all the risks and all the dangers of their own fishing business. This is a risky proposition. They, this is not as if he says, follow me and I'll make you librarians of quiet little people. Follow me and we will together leave the safe confines of the shoreline. We will get in the boat together. We will launch out into the deep. We will risk the waves. We will risk the wind. We will launch out into the storms of life. And there where men and women and boys and girls are perishing all around us, we will cast our nets with the gospel and we will seek to reach them with all that is within me. They must do this heroically. They must do this daringly. To fish for men would require launching out into a hostile world and unbelieving nations. And all of them, save John, tradition says, died martyrs' deaths and required them their very life in the process of being fishers of men. But better to die in the open sea with a net in your hand attempting to rescue the lost than to be safe and sound on the shoreline twiddling your thumbs and doing nothing to reach men for Christ. All of us who claim to be followers of Christ are to be fishers of men. There are fish all around us waiting to be caught with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We live in an ocean of humanity with fish to be caught on every side. And following Christ always leads us, always leads us to be ever and always casting our nets with the gospel to be fishers of men. Last, I want you to see the impact he made. (laughs) What an invitation this was. Follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. Never was an invitation more radical than this. Never was an invitation more imposing than this. Never was an invitation more life-changing, life-altering than this. Never was an invitation so all-encompassing as this. Never was an invitation so soul-satisfying as this. Notice the impact that he made in verse 18. There it is immediately. Meaning without hesitation without deliberation, without seeking counsel, without negotiation, without any delay. The Master has spoken. 
immediately. They left their nets. They left it all for the sake of the call. They left their successful business. They left their familiar surroundings. They left the security of home. They left their family. They left their friends. They left it all. Immediately, they left their nets. Delayed obedience is no obedience. Delayed obedience is disobedience. They left their nets. They cashed it all in. And went for God and followed Him. And as Jesus kept walking by the shore of the Sea of Galilee, they stepped out of their boats and they moved out with Him to catch up with Him and to be stride for stride with Him, not knowing what the future would hold for them, not knowing the hard road that lay ahead, not knowing the opposition they would face, not knowing the martyrdom that they would suffer, simply knowing that they were called by God to follow Christ and be fishers of men and that they would do until their last dying breath. My friend, whatever Christ has called us to do, we must do it wholeheartedly and we must do it immediately when Christ calls His voice is like the sound of many waters and He drowns out every other reason not to follow. When Christ calls, we must drop whatever we are doing and follow Him in the service of His kingdom, whether it is convenient or inconvenient, whether it is in season or out of season, whether more information is needed or not to be found, whether this is likely or whether this is unlikely, when Christ calls, you must drop whatever you are doing and follow Him or live in disobedience until you finally yield. Perhaps Christ is calling you into the ministry. Then leave your nets and follow Him. Perhaps Christ is calling you to the mission field. Then leave the Sea of Galilee and go across the ocean and fish for men. Perhaps Christ is calling you to a new phase of ministry as an elder or as a deacon or as a teacher or as a supporter or an assistant in ministry. Whatever it is that Christ is calling you to do, do so with all of your heart, unconditionally, personally. Go for broke. David Livingston was the famous 19th century Scottish missionary who was gripped with a passion to reach people around the world for Christ. Livingston had received a medical degree at the University of Glasgow in Scotland. And in the midst of this medical profession, he joined the London Missionary Society and went to southern Africa where he labored to open up the dark continent for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it was Livingston who said this, I will go anywhere with God, provided it is forward. Will you say that to God today? For most of us, God is not going to send us to Africa. For most of us, God is not going to send us to the other side of the world. But would you say to God, God, I will go anywhere with you. I will do anything that you require. I will pay any price. And God, I will never go in reverse. And I will never idle in neutrality. I will go with you anywhere as long as it is forward. And by the grace of God, He will use us to be fishers of men. Would you go to heaven? 
would you go to the presence of God when you die? More important than going forward is to go upward. When you die, will you go to heaven? The only way you may go to heaven is for you to become a follower of Jesus Christ. The only way for you to go forward and upward to heaven when you leave this world and not go downward into hell is for you to believe upon the Son of God who died upon the cross for sinners, for you to believe upon Jesus Christ who came to seek and to save that which is lost, for you to become a true follower within your heart of Jesus Christ and for you to leave this world and cut your ties with your allegiances to this world, and for you to wholeheartedly and exclusively commit, surrender your life to the King of kings and to the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. He will not come follow you. You must repent. You must stop. You must turn around. And you must follow Him. If you have never become a follower of Jesus Christ, may God this moment open your eyes and open your heart and open your ears to hear what you have never truly heard in your inner person and in your soul. May God the Holy Spirit cause this invitation of the Gospel to come all the way to your soul and for you to realize that God is calling you to Himself. And may you hear the voice of the Shepherd this day calling you to believe upon Him. If you will respond, He will receive. If you will believe, He will save. If you will repent, He will redeem. May you believe upon Jesus Christ and follow Him. Let us pray. Our Father, we bless Your name for the great privilege of being followers of Your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank You that You have not called us to that which is sterile and clinical and institutional and void and empty and vain. Thank You that You have called us to that which is living, which is spiritual, which is supernatural, which is personal, which is the person of Your Son, Jesus Christ. And it is in His name that we pray. Amen. The following has been an audio recording of Christ Fellowship Baptist Church and is under the direct copyright of Christ Fellowship Baptist Church. All recordings may be used freely for the ministry and application of the Word of God. However, written permission must be obtained from Christ Fellowship Baptist Church before any recording is broadcast or redistributed in any form. In no way should this recording be disseminated without the express consent of Christ Fellowship Baptist Church.